We begin with a story of two countries, both of them nuclear powers, with two distinct media spheres and two different journalistic representations of the same issue. India and Pakistan are at loggerheads, and again, the issue is Kashmir. This past month, an attack on an army base on the Indian side of the line of control left 19 Indian soldiers dead. The government in New Delhi quickly accused Pakistan of being responsible, and a spark was lit for the media on both sides of the border. On the Pakistani airwaves, newscasts have led with denials of responsibility from the military. On the Indian side, the mainstream narrative revolved largely around what would be an appropriate form of retaliation. Kashmir, territory that both sides claim, has seen clashes, protests and curfews on the Indian-occupied side for three months now. The rhetoric on the Indian and Pakistani airwaves, where news channels often provide more heat than light, had already been ratcheted up. The cross-border attacks have taken the talk of war to another level. This is a precarious situation, and the media are not making the job of diplomats and governments any easier. Our starting point this week, once again, is Kashmir. Operation. Propaganda is a part of diplomacy. Continuing coverage from the India Today war room. This Both Indian and Pakistanis have been indulging in massive propaganda wars. I mean, it's the ultimate he says, she says, right? The Indian Army conducted surgical strikes last night. Surgical strikes ka jhootha propaganda Bharat ne shuru kya. When you have a headline that says rage, I mean, what does that mean? Deshpar, bohut bada hamla. Conflict is great television. I am warning you that India is going to Pakistan and is going to be a war. So, if they play up the conflict, they'll get more ratings. And if they dress up for the conflict, those ratings might be higher still. Gorev Savant anchors a primetime program on a news channel called India Today. He recently transformed his studio into what he calls a war room. What should India's response be? Savant is not the only loud, belligerent voice on the Indian airwaves these days, talking about Kashmir and Pakistan. He has plenty of company. He is just the only one making a statement sartorially. You had God of Savant who came in khaki cargoes and a vest, fit enough to go to do war reportage, you know, had set up a military control room for his television program. And, you know, when somebody spoke about talking to Pakistan, etc., etc., he said, no, we're only discussing military options here because this is a war room. Send in the Air Force, send in the Army, or be covert, take out the leadership and have deniability. This argument that the media has been trying to force the government's hand into a warlike situation with Pakistan, it's an old question. Whether Narendra Modi's hand were being forced by the media, I think the media was only reflecting the growing sense of resentment, the growing sense of anger which existed within India. And if that means that the media was forcing the government's hands towards a war, so be it. Whether it's the Indian media or the Pakistani media, they have very little interest in seeing the truth of what the other side is saying. If the Indian media becomes very, very hostile... Because till last week when Indian soldiers were dying, you said talk to Pakistan. When there's uh, flashing headlines, the Pakistani media feels that it is required to counter that propaganda. What's worse is that Pakistani channels uh, most of them do not air in India, and Indian channels do air in Pakistan, but definitely not the newsy channels. That ends up basically creating two very different vacuums. Pakistanis and Indians are consuming uh, different news about the same events. So it's unfortunately driving a serious wedge between the two countries. The Kashmir story has been boiling over for three months now. The unrest began with the killing by Indian forces of a young Kashmiri militant, Burhan Wani. Demonstrations erupted across Indian-administered Kashmir. Curfews were imposed, mobile phone services suspended, and a reported 70 civilians were killed in clashes with security forces, another 7,000 reported injured. Then came the cross-border attack on an Indian base that killed 19 soldiers. Delhi said Islamabad was behind the attacks. Pakistan has been known to fund and train militants who target Indian soldiers based in Kashmir. 
India followed up with a series of retaliatory attacks against Pakistani targets in the region, strikes described by the government in Delhi as surgical. Significant casualties have been caused to the terrorists. And those I think that Indian forces certainly did strike Pakistan where it hurts them the most, but where Pakistan has been hurt even more is by India's decision to go public with it. The army has raided at least five terror launch pads. By going public, the Indian power. government changed the rules of engagement. A couple of days later, the uh, Pakistanis had really upped the ante and uh, brought in around uh, 40 journalists from local and international networks. The New York Times, the Associated Press, the BBC, uh, AFP, everybody was in there. And it was interesting to see how those reports, which were essentially ascertaining that none of the locals have heard anything. But we've been brought here by the Pakistani military to be shown that Indian claims of a surgical strike are nowhere to be found. Maybe the Indian claims are a bit of an exaggeration. It was a very, very clever move. And it actually threw the ball back in the Indian court. It said, well, we've shown in the international media what's happening on the ground. This is one of the points that Indian military is saying that they crossed over and conducted a surgical strike. We've shown proof of the fact that this so-called surgical strike did not take place. Well, show us yours. That the Kashmir story is so ever-present on the airwaves of South Asia is, historically speaking, appropriate because Kashmir helped shape the broadcasting landscape there. In 1999, Pakistan still had just one television channel, the state-owned PTV. When fighting erupted in Kashmir over the strategic city of Kargil, multiple privately owned Indian news channels rode that story hard. India eventually prevailed on the ground and the government in Islamabad would soon make changes affecting what would go out on the air. And this is when the Indian uh, private television media was emerging. This was their, let's say, baptism of fire. These journalists went to Kargil. They showed bodies of Indian soldiers. India blocked Dawn, which is Pakistan's premier uh, newspaper. So uh, the Indian side couldn't see what the Pakistanis were saying. And what you had was a lot of nationalism, patriotism, the war. In a way, the Kargil conflict was inspiring for Pakistan because Pakistan saw what a nationalist or a hyper-nationalist media did for India. It brought India together. Counter-attacks have started from the Pakistani side. Versus Pakistan's own uh, state-run media, which is very bleak and anemic. Interestingly, General Musharraf, who was ruling after that conflict through a coup, brought in Pakistani media to emulate the hyper-nationalist Indian media. So the tone was set in the 90s, and uh, uh, the rest of it is history. Or history on the run, as journalism has been called. Not that everything on the South Asian airwaves these days can be called journalism. Some of it is jingoism, camouflaged as war reporting, talking tough from the safety of the studio.